All right, so with this video, what we're going to do is just work through um, the chapter six review document that's on Canvas and the, the chapter six module. Um, and with it, the, the answer key is already available. Um, so if you want, you can kind of just go through practice on your own and then check the, the answer key. Um, and then if you're you're not understanding something, it may be useful to kind of go to this video and actually see how we're, we're setting up each of these. Um, but because the, the answer key is already available, I am just going to kind of skip ahead and just sort of explain why we're setting them up the, the way that they are rather than actually go through and and set all these uh, different ones up. But if you want to practice on your own first, definitely um, just kind of go through the, the document and you can work through them at your, your own pace and then check the answer key or check this video, kind of see how we're, we're setting these up. Uh, but with it, before we actually look at those, just a quick review of the, the two equations we're going to have. So with the, the gas laws, that's what we'll start with first. Um, we've got two different equations that we can we can utilize depending on what we're trying, trying to figure out. The first one is our combined gas law, where we've got pressure, volume, and temperature on the, the left-hand side describing the initial conditions for that gas sample. And then P2V2, T2 on the, the right-hand side are showing how those um, properties are going to change um, as we manipulate the, the sample. So we can change the, the pressure and the volume, see how the, the temperature is gonna be affected. Um, or we can change any of these, these variables and see how the, the others are going to um, sort of have to, to react in order to um, adjust for whatever that, that change is gonna be. And then with this equation, remember if we ever hold something constant, we can essentially remove that variable from the, the equation. And that's how we can get Charles, uh, excuse me, Charles law or Boyle's law, um, Gay-Lussac law, any of those where we're just looking at two of these variables. Um, and with it again, for instance, if the, the temperature is held constant, but we manipulate the, the pressure or the volume, we could remove temperature from this equation and then just have P1V1 is equal to P2V2. Uh, but again, that's only if the temperature is going to be the same thing on both sides of this reaction. And then our other equation, um, instead of looking at how a, a gas sample is going to change from one set of conditions to the next, like we can with the, the combined gas law, we've also have the, the ideal gas law. So PV is equal to NRT, where we can determine these properties of pressure, volume, temperature is still what PV and T are representing. The um, the letter N in this case is representing the, the moles of gas. And then R is just going to be a, um, a constant. And then depending on the specific units we have in the, the other pieces, the, the value for R can actually change depending on the, the units we need there. But we're going to limit it to 0 0.08206 because the units we're going to have for pressure and volume are going to be liter and atmosphere. And then for mole, we'll have the, the mole. And then for temperature, we're going to have that in Kelvin. Because remember, with these equations, it's going to be important that we actually keep the, the temperature in Kelvin. Um, because in science, we pretty much never use Fahrenheit. Um, and then if we were to use Celsius, we can actually have negative temperatures. So that would affect our, our calculation. So with these gas laws, we need to make sure that we're using um, the, the te temperature in Kelvin. And then with that, Kelvin will be equal to Celsius. plus 273.15. And then with these calculations, um, we're gonna keep it simple and then pretty much just do Kelvin's equal to Celsius plus 273. Uh, but to be more precise, we would really have 273 plus, or 273.15, excuse me. Um, but with these two equations, depending on the type of question, we need to determine which one we're gonna use um, and then determine specifically what we're trying to solve for, because in each case, we've got a whole bunch of different variables. So depending on what's being asked, we could be solving for a lot of different things with these, uh, these equations. But just to, to kind of go through the answer key and see why it is, um, or how we would set these ones up with number one, and actually I'll kind of do it like that. Um, how many moles of gas occupy 98 liters at a pressure of 2.8 atmospheres? and a temperature of 292 Kelvin. So anytime we're looking for a question that involves moles of gas, that should be an indicator that we're gonna be using the, the PV equal to NRT equation. Um, but with that, 
PV is equal to, to NRT. In this case, we're solving for moles of gas. So we're trying to solve for moles. So what we're going to do is divide both sides by RT. So what we'll ultimately wind up with is number of moles of gas is equal to the, the pressure times volume divided by the, the gas constant um, times the, the temperature in the denominator there. That's why if we look at the setup for this one, again, they rearrange the equation, 28 uh, or 2.8 atmospheres times 98 liters on the top. Then we've got the, the gas constant times the, the temperature in Kelvin on the bottom. And then when you go through, in this case, we should only have two sig figs in our, our final answer, um, just because the initial values were given 98 liters, 2.8 atmospheres, each only contain two sig figs as well. Um, and then as we continue to the, the next one, in this case, if five moles of oxygen and three moles of nitrogen are placed in a 30 liter tank at a temperature of 25 degrees C, what will be the pressure of the resulting mixture of gases be? Um, and in this case, it gives us the, the conversion from 25 degrees Celsius to 298 Kelvin. Um, or at least it does in this case, because that's part of the, uh, we're showing the, the setup here, but we need to make that conversion initially. So when we plug in our temperature, we should have 298. Um, and again, we're going to be using PV equals NRT. It's just in this case, we're looking for pressure. So we're going to rearrange our equation a little bit differently to solve for, for pressure. So we're going to divide both sides by the, the volume. And that's why we wind up with pressure is equal to um, NRT over, over volume. And in this case, what they did is they determined the, the, the pressure for each of those gases individually. And then using Dalton's law, they just add those pressures up. What we could have also done is use the ideal gas equation. N for N, because the, the gas equation, the ideal gas equation, um, is just interested in the, the mole, number of moles of gas, not actually interested in what gas it is specifically. We could have done this in a single step if we plug in eight moles rather than five or three. Um, and again, that's going to be because with this ideal gas equation, it's treating every single gas the same. It's assuming every gas is behaving as a, a truly ideal gas, when in reality, that's not going to be exactly the case, but it still does a good job of approximating that. Um, so to set this one up, we could find the, the pressure for each of those gases individually and then add them up, um, or we could recognize that five moles of oxygen and three moles of nitrogen is the same as just having eight moles of any gas. Um, so we can plug that eight into our, our PV equals NRT equation too, and then solve for the, the pressure. Uh, but again, we're going to wind up with just two sig figs in our, our final answer because the, the number of moles we're given um, only had two sig figs initially as well. Number three, a balloon is filled with 35 liters of helium in the, the morning when the, the temperature is 20 degrees C. By noon, the, the temperature has risen to 45. What is the, the new volume? So in this case, this is going to be where we use our, our different equation, the, the PV um, or P1V1 is equal to uh, P2V2 over, over T2. Um, in this case, though, what we can do and the, what, they're, what they're showing here is they're removing pressure from that equation because if you think about it, the, the air pressure is going to be essentially the, the same if we're thinking about just sea level. Even with a, a change in temperature, the, the pressure is going to stay about one atmosphere. So if we go back to our um, P1V1 is equal to, um, this equation, in this case, what we're doing is saying oops, that the pressure is going to stay the same on both sides of that uh, reaction. We're going to change the volume, we're going to change the, the temperature, but the pressure is staying the same. So since P1 and P2 are going to be equal, they're essentially going to cancel each other out. And that's why we can use the, um, whoops. That's why when we get to this equation, we could really do, oops, of course, V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2 for, for number three. 
but we're going to be solving for the, the new volume. So we're solving for V2. So we're going to have to wind up cross multiplying and ultimately winding up with that equation. But then when we plug it in, we've got to make sure that we change the, the temperature from Celsius to Kelvin. So that's why we have 318 and 293 Kelvin rather than um, 20 and 45 degrees Celsius. We have the initial volume, so we can just solve for what the, the change in volume is going to be there as well. And then in this case, everything had three sig figs in it. So our, our final answer should have three sig figs as well. That's why we're saying we're going to have a volume of 38 liters. Um, and with this one, volume and temperature are going to be directly related. So it makes sense that if we're increasing the, the temperature from 20 degrees Celsius to 45, that we should also be increasing the, the, the volume as well. Um, and that's what we see here as it expands from 35 to 38 liters. So we see it increase slightly because we're seeing a slight increase in that temperature as well. Um, and then moving on to, to number four, a 35 liter tank of oxygen is at 315 Kelvin with an internal pressure of 190 atmospheres. How many moles of gas does the, the tank contain? In this case, we're using the, the PV equals NRT equation again. We're solving for the, the number of moles of gas. So moles is going to be equal to, to PV over RT. We have the, the information for all of those different variables. Um, so 190 times 35 on the top, the gas constant times 315 Kelvin on the, the bottom. And then since our initial values for the, the volume and the, the pressure each only have two sig figs in them, our, our final answer should just have two. Uh, and that's why we're winding up with 260 moles of gas total. Um, and you'll notice in this case, it doesn't, or it does give us information in the, the question that the, the gas is oxygen. But when we calculated it, we didn't have to put anything specific about it being oxygen gas because with this PV equals NRT equation, same thing with the, the combined equation, um, we're assuming that these gases are going to be ideal. So they're going to behave the um, same regardless of what type of gas it actually is. And in reality, that's not going to be totally true. But the, the differences between a real gas and an ideal gas are going to be uh, fairly small. So that's why we can still use this equation to approximate these values. And then continuing on, the, the next one still uses PV equals NRT because we're trying to determine at what temperature the, the balloon would have to be if we had these other criteria. So we have the, the moles of gas, we have a pressure, we have a volume, we always have the, the R value. Um, so the only thing we're missing in this case is going to be temperature. So we can kind of rearrange our, our PV equals NRT equation to solve for temperature. And you know, we just want to isolate that variable. So in this case, um, we would really just divide both sides by NR to get the, the T by itself. And with it, we want to remember that in the, the cases of the uh, gas equations, we're using temperature in Kelvin. So when we solve this one, we get temperature of 296 Kelvin. But since they're asking about Celsius, we need to adjust that slightly. So we need to subtract 273. And that's why we ultimately wind up with the, the 23 degrees here. With number six, CaCO3 is going to be calcium carbonate. Um, so it decomposes at about 1200 degrees Celsius to give us carbon dioxide gas and then calcium oxide. The, the question is asking us if 25 liters of carbon dioxide are collected at that temperature, what will the, the volume of gas be after it cools to 25 degrees C? And in this one, since it doesn't give us any information about the um, number of moles, we're not going to be using PV equals NRT. Um, and because it doesn't give us anything about the, the pressure, we can just assume that the, the pressure in the, the air in that, that room is going to be the, the same. We're going to assume it's going to be constant. We could assume it's going to be one atmosphere, or we could pick any number we want. But since we're assuming it's going to be constant, we can remove pressure from our combined gas law. Oops, let me rearrange or re erase that. 
So when we're using our combined gas law, since we're removing pressure just like we did earlier, we can just have volume over temperature on both sides. But we're going to be solving for the uh, volume there, so we're really going to be multiplying T2 times V1 just to get V2 by itself. And that's what we see right here. But once we rearrange it to isolate the variable we're interested in, we can just plug in those other pieces of information. Um, and what I would also recommend, I didn't kind of show it with you, the ones we have here since it already lists what those pieces of information are. But with a, a question like this, if you were working through it on your own, what I would recommend you do is with each of these pieces of information in the, the question itself, just label what they are. So V1 for 25 liters, T1 and T2 are 1,225 uh, degrees Celsius. Again, we want to convert those to Kelvin. That's why we have 298 and 140 or 14,000 or 1,473, excuse me. Um, and again, pressure is being held constant. So that's why we don't have a, a value for any of those. So the only thing we're missing is V2. And that's why that's ultimately what we're going to be solving for. But again, you can always double check yourself and make sure that the numbers you have make sense. Because this is saying at a temperature of 1200, we're going to have a volume of 25 liters. So if we've got a temperature much, much lower than that, since these properties are related, we should have a, a volume that's much, much lower. Um, and that's what we see when we ultimately solve for this one. We've got the, the temperature, which is about one fifth of what it was initially. So that's why we see the, the volume that we're solving for is also about one fifth of what it was initially. And then the seventh one, in this case, we're gonna be using the combined gas law again. Um, but in this case, we don't hold any of those properties constant. So we change the, the pressure, we change the, the volume, we change the, the temperature. So we need to make sure we include P1, V1, and T1 in our, our equation still. So when we go to plug this one in again, we want to isolate the, the variable we're interested in. And if we read through a helium balloon with an internal pressure of one atmosphere, volume of 4.5 liters at 20 degrees C is released. So those three pieces of information are representing P1, V1, and T1. Temperature needs to be converted to Kelvin, so it should be 293 rather than 20. Um, but that's going to be our initial conditions. So that's our left-hand side. And then we're also given information about um, what volume will the, the balloon occupy in an altitude where the, the pressure is 0.6 atmospheres and negative 20 degrees C. So to isolate the, the volume by itself, we're going to cross multiply, bring T2 to the, the top of the other side, and then we're going to divide by P2, um, and that's ultimately why we wind up with the, the equation we see here. Again, we've got to cross multiply to get T2 on the, the left-hand side. We've got to divide to get P2 on the, the left-hand side. So that's why we sweep, see those, those variables sort of switch uh, places. But once we have it isolated, we already identified all of those different variables. The, the key piece is just making sure we convert those temperatures to Kelvin. So we can go through, plug everything in. And in this case, we want to have three sig figs in our, our final answer, since all of the initial values we were given have three sig figs. Um, since all of these have a zero to the, the right of a decimal at the, the end of a number, those zeros are all significant. Um, and that's why we have three sig figs in all of these. And that's why we should have three sig figs just in that final answer there. And then number eight, there are 135 liters of gas in a container at a temperature of 260 degrees C. If the, the gas was cooled until the volume decreased to 75 liters, what would the, the temperature of the, the gas be? 
And again, if they don't give you information about one of those um, components, we can essentially just remove that piece. We're not told anything about the other pressure. So we can just assume that the other pressure is going to remain constant, which means we can remove it from our equation. So that's why with the combined gas law, we can just have T1 over, or V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. In this case, we're solving for T2, though. So what we're going to see is V1 over T1, V2 over T2. Um, so we're going to cross multiply both sides. So we'll get V1, T2. Oops. Is equal to V2 over T1. And then since T2 is what we're, we're interested in, what I'll do is just do it with this. With the, the trickiest piece may just be identifying what variable we're looking for and kind of isolating it. Um, so we can solve for that one. But in this case, we're looking for T2. We've got the, the initial volume. We've got the, the final volume. We know what the, the initial temperature is. We just got to convert it to, to Kelvin. Um, and once we do that, we can just solve for, for that missing piece. So we should see that the temperature, um, when it cools, if it winds up with a, a volume of 75 liters, would have to cool all the way down to, to 23 degrees C, um, just a little bit under 300 Kelvin. And then for number nine, a 75 liter container holds 62 moles of gas at a temperature of 215. What is the, the pressure in atmospheres? Um, in this case, we just have to divide both sides by the volume to isolate the, the pressure on its own. And then we've got the, the pressure on its uh, on the, the left by itself. We know the, the number of moles of gas from the question. R is just the, the gas law constant. So we always have that piece of information. Temperature was given to us. We just have to make sure to convert it to Kelvin. So we should have 488 rather than 215 Celsius. And then we were also given the, the volume. So we know the, the bottom piece of that equation. We can plug all that in. And since we've got two sig figs in 75 liters and two sig figs in 62 moles, we should wind up with two sig figs in our final answer. Um, and that's why we should just have 33 atmospheres there. With number 10, in this case, we're thinking about a, a piston. Starts under some initial conditions. In this case, it's got um, a pressure of one atmosphere and a, a volume of six liters. And then something comes and compresses that, so pushes down on the, the piston. We wind up with a, a new volume of 3.5 liters. We want to also determine what the, the new pressure is going to be. And in this case, we're just going to remove temperature from our um, combined gas law. So we would just wind up with P1V1 is equal to P2V2. And then looking at the, the equation or the, the question, we're given the, the volume initially to start. We're given the, the pressure of the initial um, gas. So we've got P1 and V1 to start our, our question. We're also given V2. So we can just kind of rearrange that. as such, and then plug those values in, we should ultimately see that with the, the new volume, the pressure is going to increase to about 1.7 atmospheres. And with the pressure and volume, they're going to be inversely related. So as one of them goes up, the other is going to go down. Um, so it makes sense that as we decrease the volume, we have to increase the, the pressure. And the, the reason for that is if we've got less space, but we've got the, the same amount of gas, now it's just going to be um, essentially packed tighter together. So we're just going to have a little bit more pressure in there just because we're squeezing everything closer together. Number 11 is kind of a, a different question um, in the, the sense that we've got to make a, a conclusion based on our, our calculation. So a gas canister can uh, tolerate internal pressures up to 210 atmospheres. 
and then it's telling us a, a two liter canister um, holding three and a half moles of gas is heated to 1350 degrees Celsius. Will the, the canister explode? So first should always just convert to, to Kelvin if we're looking at these gas equations. So that 15 uh, or 1350 becomes a little bit over 1600 Kelvin. But then we're given the number of moles. Again, we always have the, the gas constant. We just determine the, the temperature in Kelvin. And then we're given the, the volume. So we're given enough information to determine everything but the, the pressure. Or let's see, I should say that's the only thing we can, can determine since we're given all of the, the other information explicitly. Um, so when we go in through and plug that all in, what we calculate is the, the pressure in the, the canister itself wind up with an answer of 230 atmospheres. Um, and this wasn't the, the question we were asked, wasn't what is the, the pressure inside that canister. The, the question was, will this canister explode? Um, so because we've calculated 230 atmospheres for the internal pressure, but it can only withstand 210 atmospheres, that's why we're saying that it, it will explode. There's gonna be too much uh, pressure within that, that container. And, um, the, the walls of the container, the walls of the, the canister aren't going to be able to withstand that much pressure. For number 12, just like with number, I think it was 10, whoops. Yeah, just like with number 10, we're going to be using P1V1 is equal to P2V2 because the, the temperature is going to be held constant. We don't have any information about the, the number of moles. We don't have any information about the, the temperature. So we can't use PV equals NRT. Um, we're looking to see how this gas sample is going to change as we uh, change the, the pressure. So we're going to be solving for the, the new volume. And with the, the pressure, we went from 3.2 to 4 atmospheres. So we increased the, the pressure slightly. So we should see the, the volume decrease since these are inversely related. Um, and when we plug everything in and solve, we wind up with 2.3 liters which makes sense because we started at 2.9, but we increase the, the pressure, so we're pushing everything closer together. We should wind up with a, a smaller volume in this case. Number 13, an air con airtight container with a volume of 4.25 times 10 to the fourth liters. Before we even continue, you could just plug that into your calculator exactly as it is with, with scientific notation. Um, or remember, the, the number on that exponent tells us how many uh, digits we need to move the, the decimal. Um, so in the, the case of 4.25 times 10 to the fourth, that means we would move it over four spots. So what that's really telling us is we'll wind up with 425. Zero, zero liters. So 42,500 um, liters is what we're, we're looking at there. Uh, and then it gives us more information about the, the pressure and the, the temperature of this container. It then tells us the, the container is washed off of the, the boat or the, the ship, sinks to a, a depth where there's going to be um, so much pressure just because of all of the, the water pushing down on it, um, and also a, a very low temperature, or a relatively low temperature, lower than what we, we started with at least. Um, we want to determine what the, the volume of the, the gas inside will be. And with it, we don't have anything about the, the number of moles. We only have pressure, volume, and temperature. So we're going to be using P1, V1, T1. Um, and in this case, it gives us an initial pressure, gives us an initial temperature, gives us a, a final value for each of those as well. But we only have an initial volume because V2 is going to be what we're, we're solving for in this case. So again, we've got to kind of rearrange our equation, solve for the, the variable we're interested in. Um, and the, the big thing is always making sure that we're changing these pressure or changing these temperature units, excuse me, uh, into Kelvin. So if we plug in three degrees Celsius and 15 degrees Celsius, we're gonna wind up with wildly different numbers than what we'd get if we had 276 Kelvin and 288 Kelvin like we should. 
Uh, but since all of those values were given have three sig figs, that's why we're rounding our final answer, which is at 233 liters. Fourteen. This one is going to again be using uh, Dalton's law of partial pressures. So the, the pressure of individual gases is going to be equal to the, the pressure of the entire mixture if they're in the, the same container. Um, so in this question, two flasks are connected with a, a stopcock. Flask one has a volume of 2.5 liters and contains oxygen gas at a pressure of 0.7 atmospheres. When the stopcock between the two flasks is open, which allows the, the gas to mix, we want to determine what the, the resulting pressure of that mixture is going to be. And in this case, a, a visual may be a little bit helpful. So sometimes when they have questions like this, what you can kind of think of it as is we essentially have two sort of dumbbell shaped things. So I'll do one in red, I'll do another in blue, just to show the, the different gases. And then with those, they've got the, the divider in the middle. That's why I'm using the, the different colors to show that uh, oxygen may be in one, hydrogen may be in the other. But when we remove the, the stopcock, allow these two substances to mix, they're not going to just stay on their one side. They're then going to move evenly throughout the entire uh, volume of the, the container. So if we look at the, the information we're given, we have an initial volume for each of these gases, flask one, flask two, 2.5 and 3.8 liters. We also have an initial pressure for each. So what we can do is solve for the, the, the new pressure that's gonna occur. Um, and in order to do that, if we think about P1, V1, is equal to, to P2V2. Again, we're given the initial volume for each of these flasks. We're given the initial pressure. So we can use those as P1 and V1 in each case. Solve for P2. We need V2. But if you think about the, the image I drew here, we could say the, the right-hand side is going to be 3.8 liters, because that could be for the hydrogen. The, the left-hand side, the 2.5 liters, could be for the, the oxygen. Once we remove that stopcock, though, and allow these two to mix, they're not just going to stay in that 2.5 or that 3.8 liters. They're going to take up the entire thing. And that's why V2 is going to be 6.3 liters. And that's going to be true for both of them. But when we look at the, the rest of those equations, you can see the, the top piece is different because for the, the oxygen, our initial pressure, our initial volume was 0.7 atmospheres and 2.5 liters. With the, the hydrogen though, it was 1.25 atmospheres and 3.8 liters. Um, but then again, when we remove the stopcocks, they're both allowed to mix in all 6.8 or 6.3 liters. So that's why we have 6.3 as P or V2 for, for each of these. Uh, but solving for, for P2 for both of those now gives us the, the new pressure for each of those gases. And it makes sense that in each case, the, the pressure decreased because we're allowing these gases to um, expand into larger volumes. So if you've got a larger volume, we should see a, a decrease in pressure um, as a result. And then with this one, the P2 that we're solving for in each case is the pressure just from that one gas. So we can use Dalton's law of partial pressure to determine that the, the sum of the, the pressure of every gas is going to be equal to the, the sum uh, of the, the individual pressures for those gases. So we can just take the, the pressure of oxygen, the pressure of hydrogen, add those two together, uh, and ultimately wind up with a, a result of one atmosphere. And for this one, Actually, we'll just we'll leave that there. Um, but looking at the, the last one in terms of these gas laws, oops, um, in this case, we're asked the weather balloon has a, a volume of 35 liters at sea level, has a 
general uh, pressure of one atmosphere. What will the, the new volume of the weather balloon be if we take that balloon and allow it to rise to a um, rise to a, a pressure where the, the new pressure or rise to an elevation or altitude, I should say, where the, the new pressure is 0.75 atmospheres. So just like the, the previous ones, I always think it's a good idea to list what these are. So 35 liters, one atmosphere, V1, P1, 0.75 atmospheres, P2. What would the, the new volume of the, the weather balloon be? So in this case, as we allow the, the weather balloon to rise, there would likely be a change in temperature as well. So we really would want T1 and T2. But since we're not given any of that information, we just have to assume that the, the temperature is going to be constant throughout this process. Um, so that's why we can rearrange our equation. P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. We can rearrange it just to solve for that, that new volume. And when we do it, we should ultimately wind up with 47 liters. Because so again, pressure and volume are going to be inversely related. As one of them goes up, the other has to go down. Um, so in this case, since we're uh, ultimately decreasing the, the pressure, we should see the, the volume expand. Uh, and that's what we see as the, the volume goes from 35 up to, to 47. Oops. And then for 16 through 18, I'll actually show how we can set these ones up. Um, but with these ones, we've got a couple of different equations we can use. Uh, so Q is equal to MC delta T. So Q is heat, M is mass, C is the, the specific heat. So it depends on the substance, allows us to know how much energy is necessary to convert one gram of that substance or to increase the, the temperature. Um, of one gram of that substance by one degree, and then delta T just referring to the, the change in temperature. And then if we're looking at phase changes, we've got our heat of fusion um, or our heat of vaporization, depending on what phase change we're, we're specifically looking at. Um, so with these types of calculations, we basically want to think about what's occurring because we've got heating curves. And with each of these different sections of this, this heating curve, so solid, liquid, and gas are the, the angled sections. We can do the, the flat sections are going to be our, our phase changes. Um, so depending on how many sections of this graph we're on, that's going to be de determining how many sort of pieces of our, our calculation we have. So with the, the first one, how much energy is released to the environment when 50 grams of water condenses? What we want to think about is what condensation is. And all it's going to be is gas to liquid. So anytime we've got the, the phase change involving a gas, we're going to be using the, the heat of vaporization. Um, because with it, we're going to be looking at the, the phase changes with the, the flat section. So we don't have any temperature change, so we can't have delta T there at all. Um, so we're looking at either one of those heat of vaporization or heat of fusion equations. Um, but since vaporization, as vapor may suggest, vaporization is referring to uh, the, the process of going from liquid to gas. Fusion is going to be melting, so solid to liquid. We can also use those for the, the reverse process. So in this case, we're going to use the, the vaporization, even though we're looking at condensation. Um, rather than boiling. So when we set this one up, we're going to have Q is equal to 50.0 grams. Since it's water, whoops, I got ahead of myself. I almost wrote the specific heat. So that would be if we're, we're changing temperature. But now if we look at the, the unit here, 
what we're going to see with the heat of vaporization. Joules per gram. So that's why when we take this and just multiply it by the, the mass, that's all we need to do because grams in the unit are going to cancel. We're going to left, be left with just the, um, the, the number of joules. And ultimately, we should wind up with just a, um, a little bit over 11,000 joules. With this one, though, since it's just saying how much energy is released, it doesn't really matter if it's a, a positive or negative number. It's just looking for the, the overall quantity. Um, but if it was asking how much energy is transferred when 50.0 grams of water condenses, what we'd want to do is just make that negative because since we're condensing it, we're cooling it, this process is going to release energy. Um, so Q would actually be equal to, to negative, oops, uh, 11,300. And what I like to do just to make sure we keep that negative sign in there is change the, the heat of vaporization or the heat of fusion, depending on what we're looking at. If we're cooling it, so gas to liquid condensation or even liquid to solid for the, the freezing um, is just to make that a heat of fusion or heat of vaporization negative so that when we get the, the Q value, we have the, the negative sign in there still. Um, but for the, the next one is melting endothermic or exothermic. With these heating diagrams, heating curves, we've got the, the temp on the y-axis, so as we go up higher temperature, we've got heat So when we're looking at or we're thinking about something like melting, we want to think about what's occurring here. And in the, the case of melting, that's what we're looking at. So we're looking at that flat section there. Um, and we're moving from the left to the right because we're going solid to liquid in the case of melting. So with melting, what we're going to see is it's going to be an endothermic process because it's going to involve the absorption of energy in order for it to occur. So even though we don't have the, the temperature changing at all, as we go from solid to liquid, we're moving left to right across this graph. So we're moving further to the right, meaning we need more of that heat energy. So since the, the energy is gonna be going into the system then, that's why we see um, the, the temperature increase on those angled sections as we move to the right. It's absorbing that, that energy, gaining more kinetic energy. We're gonna see something similar here. It's just instead of that energy going towards a change in temperature, a change in kinetic energy, now we're just using the, the energy to change the, the phase of matter. It's still going to be an energetic process. It's just not going to actually change the, the temperature at all. Um, but the, the reason melting, just like boiling, is going to be endothermic is going to be because it's releasing or it's absorbing energy, excuse me. Whereas if we were going in the opposite direction, gas to liquid or liquid to solid. Now that substance is going to be releasing energy, it's going to be losing energy overall. Um, and that's why we would consider the, the reverse processes to be exothermic. Oops. Got a couple more, so four more. Okay. So with the 18th one, calculate the amount of heat needed to melt 35 grams of ice express your answer in kilojoules. Um, this one, I'm just going to skip ahead to the, the answer key for this 18th one, just because it'll be relatively simple. Um, but with this one, number 18, looking at the, the bottom here, going to be very similar to the previous one we did. Just in this case, we've got 35 grams rather than 50. And in this case, we're looking at melting instead of boiling or condensation. So now we're looking at the, the heat of fusion. 
So that's why we're going to use 334 instead of 2,260. Um, but in the, the case of number 18, since we're heating the substance, we're melting it, we're going from solid to liquid, we would be moving left to right. That's why we would still keep this value as positive. Um, and then if we want to make sure that we're expressing our answer in kilojoules, the, the prefix kilo, just like with distance, a kilometer is 1,000 meters. A kilojoule is going to be 1,000 joules. Um, so if we have 11,690 joules, if we want to pay attention to sig figs, we should only have three. Um, so we're ultimately going to be rounding that to 11.7 kilojoules there. And then with these remaining ones, um, and I'll go up to the top just so we can kind of think about it a little bit more. So with 19, 20, and 21, Then we want to kind of think about where we're starting on this heating curve, where we're moving to. So with number 19, calculate the amount of heat needed to convert 140 grams of liquid water from 23 degrees C. So if we're starting with the liquid, we're starting in the, the middle section of this graph. And in this case, we are converting 140 grams of this liquid water to water vapor at 100 degrees C. So what that's going to require is an increase in temperature. But it's also going to require that phase change. So we're going to need two different pieces to this graph. We'll have MC delta T for the, the temperature change, that first section. And then what I'll actually do is put the second section in green so we can kind of see what we're, we're dealing with there. But now we've got a different calculation to represent each of these different pieces of this graph that we're, we're looking at. Um, and that's why if we then go and actually solve for Q, we're going to see 140.0 grams since it's water, 4.18 joules per gram degree C. And 100 minus 23 will be 77 degrees C. For this one, unlike the, the gas laws, we don't need to convert these temperature to Kelvin since we're just looking at the, the change in temperature. Um, and since one degree Celsius is equal to one Kelvin change, uh, we can just do the, the difference here. So 100 minus 23 gives us 77 degrees Celsius plus and then we want to consider the amount of energy that's going to be needed for the, the phase change. So 140 grams times 2,000. Oops, of course, that's going to happen right there. Plus 2,000. 260 joules per gram. Um, and that's why when you go through and actually plug it in, what we're ultimately going to get is 45 joules plus. And for this one, what we should really have for this temperature. It's a hundred point just to make that a uh, 
minute with number 20. So with number 20, again, do the, the kind of the same thing, calculate the amount of heat needed to convert 94 grams of ice from negative 17 degrees C to liquid water at five. So in this case, we're starting on the, the bottom section of our, our curve. We've got to do some heating to get to the, the liquid or to get to that melting point, I should say. Then we've got to do um, a little bit more, got to add a little bit more energy in order for the, the phase change to occur. Uh, but in this case, we're going to go a little bit further, and then we're going to continue to heat up that, that new state of matter. So in this case, we should actually have three different pieces to our graph. The, the first one, oops, started in red. MC delta T plus, and in this case, we're going to use the, the heat of fusion since it's melting rather than boiling or condensation. And then we'll also have plus, what is this? So M C delta T. What I want to point out is the, the C values here are going to be different because with the, the first one, we're going to be looking at the, the solid ice. Whereas with the, the second one, we're going to be looking at the liquid water. So those are going to absorb heat differently. Um, and that's why we're going to have a different value for each of those. So when we actually go to, to plug this one in, we're going to wind up with 94 grams. And what is the specific? I think it's 2.06. Yeah. 2.06 joules per gram degree C. And in this case, we're going to have a temperature change of 17 degrees C. And again, it's final minus initial, so it should be zero minus negative 17. That's why we're winding up with a positive unit here. The, the second piece where we're looking at the, the phase change, we still have 94 grams, but we don't have a temperature change at all. So that's why when we look at the, the heat of vaporization or the, the heat of fusion in this case, the, the unit's just going to be joules per gram because we only need to cancel out that gram unit. Um, but the, the final step now, we are continuing to heat this substance. So we'll have 94 grams. We'll now use the, the specific heat for water. So that 4.8, 4.18, excuse me. Um, and in this case, we should have five degrees C. So when you go through and actually Solve for it. What you should get is thirty-three thousand joules, thirty-three hundred joules, thirty-one thousand joules, and then eighteen. Oops. Oops. That's what. And I had the, the wrong thing written here, so it should be 45 degrees C at the end. So we'll have a temperature change of 45 degrees for that, that final piece. And that's why we're going to see, when we calculate it, we should get 18,000 there. And when we add them all up, we'll wind up with 5, 2, 300. And the, the final one, oops, I got a lot to erase here. Um, final one going to be that, that same idea, but in this case, what we're going to do is actually have five different pieces uh, for this equation, because for the, the final one, number 21, in this case, we're starting with steam at 140 degrees. But then we're cooling it all the way down to, to solid ice at 
um, negative 58 degrees C. So if we put another kind of diagram here for the, the heating curve. In this case, we're starting at 140 degrees. We've got to cool it down to 100. We've got to continue to take energy away in order for the, the phase change to occur in order to get it to a liquid. We then continue to cool it from liquid into the, the solid. Another phase change. And then finally, we're going to cool it down all the way to negative 58 degrees. Um, so we're going to have to get this very low. And that's why we'll have a, a fifth section here. With it again, we'll have a different equation for, for each of these pieces. So for each of these phase changes, um, with each of those phase changes, those sections that I've outlined there, we're going to have a Q is equal to MC delta T calculation, since we actually have the, the temperature changing. With it, though, the C delta T piece is going to be different for each of those equations. So we'll still have the same mass. We'll have 306 grams for each of those. But the, the specific heat is going to be 4.18 for water, for liquid water, 2.06 for the, the solid ice, 1.87, or whatever it says at the, the top of the page for the, the vapor. Um, so we'll have a different specific heat for each of these different states of matter. And then we've also got a different change in temperature. So for the, the, the gas, we're cooling it down by 40 because it goes from 140 to start to 100 for the, the boiling point. Um, and then with the, the water, we're going 100 to zero. With the, the solid ice, we're going zero to negative 58. Um, but in each case, we should see a, a negative temperature there since we are cooling these down or a negative temperature change, I should say, since we're cooling them down. And then with the other sections here, we're now going to have the, the Q. Oops. Heat of vaporization or heat of fusion. And again, the, the mass is still going to be 306. Just depending on which one we're focused on, we'll either use 334 for the, the heat of fusion in terms of joules per gram um, or the, the 2260 for the um, heat of vaporization. And that's why when we piece all this together, I'm not going to write it out just because it's going to be kind of a mess trying to do it with the, the stylus on this page. Um, but that's why when we get to the, the calculation here, you can see in each, oops, let me get the, the pen working. You can see all three of these terms I've underlined in red are that M cat equation, but we've got a different C value. That's why I've actually specified steam or water or ice. And then the, the delta T, like I said, it's going to be different for each of them because we're looking at different temperature changes for those different states of matter. Um, and actually, I'll underline this piece as well. you can kind of see where each of these pieces are fitting in. So again, the, the red is representing our, our temperature changes where we're looking at just one state of matter. The, the green is going to be the, the heat of fusion or heat of vaporization, excuse me. The, the blue will be the heat of fusion because that's involving the, the phase change of the solid. Um, and then you'll notice in each case, the, the terms we get for these are negative because with the, the temperature changes, we're cooling it down. So since we do final minus initial, we wind up with temperature or changes in temperature like 100 minus 140, giving us negative 40 degrees. Um, I actually have this one backwards. So this one should be 100 or zero minus 100 um, because it's final minus initial. So since we're cooling down the water from 100 degrees C to zero, that's why we wind up with a negative 100 for the temperature change. And then the, the same thing for the, the final one on the end there. Um, 
And then even with the, the heat of fusion, heat of vaporization that I underline in blue and green, um, with those ones, you could make the entire term negative by putting the, the minus sign in front of the mass. But for me, it's just easiest to remember by changing the, the heat of vaporization or the heat of fusion just to a negative number. Um, so that's the, the way that I like to do it. I think that's the, the easiest and it's the least likely way that you'll you'll forget the, the negative sign in my, my opinion. Um, but with these, Again, it's just kind of getting practice, getting familiar with the, the way we set them up with the, the gas law equations. It's kind of identifying what piece of information are we given? What are we trying to solve for? So we can determine which of those equations do we want to use. Um, and if we're using the combined gas law, we may be able to remove one of those terms if something remains the same. So if temperature is held constant, we can remove T1 and T2. Um, whereas if we're solving for the, the moles of gas, we're going to be using the, the ideal gas uh, equation, PV is equal to nRT. And then with the, the heat equations, just like we did with the, the couple examples here, we want to kind of identify if we're looking at our, um, where did it go? If we're looking at our, our heating curve, sort of what section of that curve are we starting on? Where are we moving to? Because each of these different sections is going to involve a different calculation. Um, so we need to kind of identify that, that information before we start so we can make sure we're setting up our, our math correctly. Um, but with these, if you do have any questions, please let me know. We can either meet during office hours um, or if you send me a message, I can try to explain it a little bit differently that way too.